Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. Thank you so much to all of my patrons. If your name is on screen right now, then you're a legend. Our love and respect goes out to all those that knew and loved Nicole and all those affected by this dark case. Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Nicole van der Hayden was born in 1985 in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. As a lover of everything natural, she grew up knowing that whatever she did, it would have to do with the outdoors. This is why after graduating high school in 2003, Nicole attended the University of Wisconsin in Green Bay. She studied for a double major in science and education. Then earning her degree, Nicole pursued her passions for nature. She then spent six years as a substitute teacher for the Green Bay area. But there was one thing that Nicole loved and wanted more than anything else to be a mother. With her first husband, Nicole gave birth to two beautiful children. After her divorce, she had a third child with a short-term boyfriend, Doug Dietrich. Despite the surprise of an unexpected child, the two decided to stay together to be parents to Nicole's three children. They collaborated with her ex-husband to give them the best life possible. Manitowoc is the maritime capital of Wisconsin. It's responsible for the rich history History of the Lake Michigan region, and it's a smaller town with a quaint culture which made it a good place for Nicole's kids to grow up. This case begins on May the 20th, 2016. One of Doug and Nicole's friends named Greg had called the couple and invited them on a night out with friends. Nicole, also known as Nikki, was now 31. She hadn't had much time for herself since she'd given birth to her third child, Dylan. Nicole and Doug decided that this was their opportunity for a well-deserved break. So they called Nicole's mother to watch Dylan. With their other two kids already being at their father's. So, the plan for the night was set. Nicole's mom was to watch Dylan until her friend Dallas got off work. There, she would pick up Dylan and watch him until the couple returned home. It was 8pm when the couple left home for a local bar called The Watering Hole. Nikki took this opportunity to let loose. On this occasion, she drank much faster than the friends that she was with. Her friends kept a close eye. They allowed Nikki to have her fun. One night of fun, after months and years of responsibilities as a new mother to yet another child. By 11pm, Doug had run into some of his friends that had turned up at the bar. He was now excited to spend time with them rather than Nicole. Nicole and her friends wanted to go to another bar, but Doug and his friends wanted to stay behind. However, he said that they would just catch up with them in a little while. The group then split up as Nikki and her friends journeyed to the sardine can. When when more than an hour had gone by, Nicole got upset that Doug hadn't turned up yet. She then called him multiple times but got no answer. She grew more and more angry with every voicemail that she left. At that point, one of Nikki's friends had decided to try and give Doug a call. Doug this time answered. This alone infuriated Nikki to the point that she sent him some nasty text messages. And then she took off away from her group of friends. Although her friends did try to stop her, she had consumed a large amount of alcohol and they tried to convince her to let them take her home. But by this stage in the night, Nicole was beyond consolation. Their attempts to get her to go home were hopeless. Nicole now screamed and fought them off. She now stormed off into the darkness just before Doug set off for the sardine can. He now called Nikki to let her know that they were on their way. Nikki's only response to this was through text message. She said that she was with another friend and no longer at the sardine can. Doug decided to brush off their fight and he continued the good time with his friends. He later arrived home to Dallas and the baby at around 3am. Nikki wasn't home but he figured that she she would just come home safely whenever she felt ready. So he then fed baby Dylan and went to bed. 
By the morning of May the 21st, Doug awoke to find that Nicky still hadn't arrived home. He didn't panic quite yet, but he began calling her friends. He was trying to find out where she had gone the night before, or if they had even heard from her. As all of the calls to Nicky's phone now went unanswered, and her friends had little idea of where she could even be, everyone in Nicky's life began to worry. They began calling local hospitals to see if she had turned up there, but they had no luck. By 4.20pm that day, Doug knew that something had to be wrong. He now called 911 to report Nicole missing. Who's missing? Uh, it's my girlfriend, and she, she does live with me, and she's never done this before. What's her name? So Nicole Vanderheiden. So she was on foot? Yes. No idea where she might go? No idea. I called some did, friends. Did she have a sister. cell phone with her or anything? Yeah, and it's been off since last night. Police arrived at the home of a pale and sickly looking Doug. He bore the obvious markings of a hangover. They questioned him regarding everything he knew about Nicole before she had vanished. They noted that he was cooperative and calm. They asked him for his phone to see if they could glean any information from it. And Doug offered it willingly. What Doug didn't know is that his call had come just over two hours after another mysterious call to 911. Uh, we just found a human body laying in the okay. suite. Okay. Oh, God. Is the person beyond help, or do I need to give yeah. instructions for CPR? No, it's okay. beyond help. The call came from a couple of teenagers. They had found a body on the side of the road in a field. The body had been badly beaten. It had bruises, shoe prints and other marks littered its skin. The only thing still adorning it being a pair of socks and a concert bracelet. The individual had a fractured jaw and marks across the neck, bringing the total injury number to a staggering 241. Whoever this was, they'd put up a fight until the brutal end. Investigators had been trying to identify who the poor afflicted person was until Doug's call. His description of a 31-year-old woman with glowing blonde hair matched that of the woman that was found in the field. Doug arrived at the sheriff's office for questioning late on the night of May the 21st. This is where investigators informed Doug of the similarities between the body they had found and his description of Nicole. The people we talked to are the people that are you know, closest to whoever's missing or, mm-hmm. or deceased, right? Yeah. Okay, so it, it's, it's totally normal for us to be talking to you. I try to assume so, yeah. And, and Greg and Aaron and everybody else that was there, mm-hmm. okay? Your whole group of friends are the last people that she was with for the most part. Yeah. Okay. I do not suspect that she did not not come home at all last night after you got Not at all. Not, it wasn't a a blip or a word from her. Okay. She never stepped foot into that house after you got home. Nope. Not that I, I mean, it would have been, no, she she didn't. I mean, I would, I was, she would have came and went to bed. And I woke up to Dylan crying, so. And you don't know where she is or what happened to her? Not a clue. You, did you do anything to cause her to go missing? No, not, not at all. Besides uh, being a bit on the phone, I mean. Well, I think what we're looking at is a uh, um, body that was found, okay, down the street. Um, I don't think it's been. 100% identified as her, but there's a lot of similarities. What happened? Well, I don't know. That's what we're trying to figure out here. That's what we don't know. Is there anything else that you can think of that would be helpful to us in this? I need to talk, I'm going to talk to everybody on that freaking street in that neighborhood. I, I need to do it. Well, that's, that's part of what we're going to do, too. You know, obviously we can't go do it at, at 2.30 in the morning. You know. Is there anything in your house that they're going to find that's going to, that's going to say that you had anything to Absolutely nothing whatsoever. Nothing. Nothing to do with this. I mean... It's just... But despite his reaction, police were still suspicious of Doug and his intentions towards Nicole. 
From his phone, they had found text messages from Doug to his mother. These expressed his attitude towards the life that he was living with Nicole. He detailed how he missed the bachelor life, and he said how he had thoughts of asking Nicole and her children to move out. It turns out he wasn't adjusting well to being a family man. Being a father was not what he had wanted for himself at this point. Remember, their baby together just kind of happened. This wasn't a planned family. In addition to these messages to his mother, officers also found messages from Nicole to Doug from the night before, ones that accused him of maltreating her frequently. Police used this information as a motivator to ask Doug if they could search the home for any possible evidence, to which he agreed. But Doug would quickly rescind this agreement. A few hours later, Doug reported that his lawyer advised him against providing any DNA evidence or allowing investigators to search his home without a warrant. This, of course, only heightened the suspicion of the officers. Luckily, their suspicion was enough to gain a warrant to search Doug and Nicole's home. But what they found inside wasn't nearly as significant as what they found outside. A dried red fluid and clumps of blonde hair. This physical evidence put investigators over the edge. They now arrested Doug in connection with the passing of Nicole. Meanwhile, investigators worked to gather as much physical evidence as possible. They took DNA from the body to both confirm that it was indeed Nicole, and also to identify any other possible DNA on her. Another search of the area where the body was found yielded Nicole's clothes and her purse, both of which too were covered in a dried red fluid. In addition, investigators needed to find out if they could match the shoe prints on Nicole's body back to Doug. While they waited for the DNA results to return, they matched a pair of Doug's shoes to the prints on Nicole's back. These shoes were also covered in this red fluid. By August of 2016, Doug Dietrich continued to sit in jail. DNA results were being anxiously awaited, but these results were not what they expected. Not even close. Firstly, the red fluid on Doug's shoes was found to be from a turkey and not a human. This caused investigators to review what they had on Doug. This included body cam footage from his initial interview. They realised that Doug had been wearing a Fitbit. A Fitbit is a fitness watch that tracks steps, calories and location, things like that. Upon police inspection of the watch, it was found that Doug had only walked 16 steps after he arrived home that night. Therefore, it was physically impossible for Doug to end Nicole's life in the front yard of his home. It also ruled him out of driving to the dump site. Upon further inspection of the car, it was determined that it never even left the garage on the night of May the 20th. And probably the most damning evidence in Doug's innocence is that the DNA found on Nicole's body did not match his. Therefore, it was physically impossible that Doug was responsible for Nicole's passing. Investigators now had to start from square one once again. Doug was released and acquitted of his charges before the police searched for the holder of this DNA evidence. Two months later, officers received a hit on a DNA on Nicole's body. This was a man named George Birch. According to Nicole's friends and family, this man was a complete stranger. George had been on trial for ending the life of a Virginia gang member. There, he was found not guilty, but it meant his DNA was now in the system. Despite being found not guilty of this crime, George was on probation in Virginia for other unrelated cases. Police had no way of finding where George was since he was supposed to be living in Virginia. This meant that if he was in Wisconsin, he was there illegally. Luckily, a hit and run case from a few months before involving George gave them an address for the owner of the car, one of George's friends. Upon arrival at the friend's residence, George was standing on a front porch, smoking a cigarette. Correct. This made it easy for officers to bring him in for questioning. Uh, first and foremost, I just need to get some quick information from you, just so I know who I'm talking to and got an idea of that. Like I said, I'm Investigator Slinger. I'm with Brown County Sheriff's Office. It's my partner, Sergeant Shepherdson. Nice to meet you. 
Engineer here is into uh, in reference to a homicide investigation into Nicole Van der Heide. Okay, so is this something that you want to talk to me about? However, during his interview, George was a closed book. He refused to speak without a lawyer present, blocking investigators from gaining a single word about Nicole. They then turned to George's cell phone records. These definitively put him at both Nicole's house as well as the location of her body. In addition to this, his browsing history also revealed that George had been researching the status of Nicole's case extensively. For someone that was a complete stranger, this is very suspicious. With the DNA evidence, investigators were more than confident in their new culprit. They arrested and charged him with the brutal ending of Nicole's life. The first day of George's trial in 2018 would set the tone for the following seven days. It was a classic case of who done it. This was a battle for the jury's favour between George Birch and Doug Dietrich. The defence's opening statement was short and sweet. They said Doug Dietrich was responsible for the passing of Nicole and Greg was completely innocent. They took this time to hammer home the humanity of George. They called him him a real American citizen. They labelled Doug as an allegedly cold-hearted, jealous boyfriend with an overwhelming amount of motive. According to the defence, the case was open and close. The prosecution, on the other hand, used their opening statement to paint the picture of what had occurred that night almost two years before. Nicole had just been looking for a ride home. Then she met George Birch at Richard Cranium's another local bar. There, they said the two flirted back and forth before George agreed to give her a ride home. They said there was the expectation that they would be intimate once they got there. But when Nikki tried to leave without any type of physical contact, George now became enraged. He went on to violate her and then beat and strangle her with an electrical cord, holding tight until she took her final breath. The trial was in motion. Day two and three saw Doug Dietrich on the stand to plead his own case. Did you have absolutely any involvement in Nikki's disappearance or death? Uh, no, I did not. A lot going through my mind. I was just so puzzled and shocked and hurt, sad. I mean, it's a whirlwind of emotions. And when Nikki was with your friends, were you concerned about her? No, it was, I with friends that I've known for a long time and trusted. The defense continued to try and implicate Doug as the perpetrator. They presented the text messages that Doug had sent to his mother, the messages about his relationship with Nicole. They also showed the accusatory messages from Nicole on the night of her passing. Doug on the stand tried his best to respond, saying that he often said things he didn't mean when he was overwhelmed. He also said that he had no idea where these accusations from Nicole had come from. He said that he had never harmed Nicole in his life. This was, of course, hard for the jury to believe given the evidence of these messages. The defence also spent time pointing out how many hours it took Doug to finally call the police after Nicole went missing. This was in addition to the fact that he had taken a shower before officers arrived at his house. According to the defence, Doug wanted to do everything he could to erase any evidence of his involvement involvement. This alleged involvement in Nicole's disappearance and subsequent passing. In the following days, the prosecution did everything possible to poke holes in George's story. George's story went pretty much like this. George had met Nicole inside Richard Cranium's bar, and there, yes, they flirted back and forth. By the way, I just worked out why the bar is called Richard Cranium's. That's actually pretty funny. But anyway, back to the case. Nicole invited George back to her place for intimate relations, but when they arrived there she realised that Doug was already home. He said that the two did have relations inside George's car in Nicole's front yard, and then Doug came out and attacked both of them. When George awoke, presumably from being knocked out, Nicole was already gone on the ground, and Doug was now pointing a firearm at him. He said that Doug forced him to 
dispose of Nicole's body. If he didn't, then he wouldn't live through the ordeal. After dumping Nicole in the field, George pushed Doug down into the ravine before driving off as fast as he could. This version of the story was a brave attempt at defence. It combated every physical piece of evidence that the prosecution had, and it blamed everything on Doug being the mastermind. The only thing they had left was the electrical cord that was found near Nicole's body, the cord that they believed was the instrument for her throttling. On its surface was both Nicole and George's DNA. Doug's was nowhere to be found. The prosecution now leaned on this piece of evidence to prove that George had been the one directly responsible for Nicole's passing and not Doug. On day 8, the final day of the trial, each side reiterated their claims. Both hoped it was enough to put either Doug Dietrich or George Birch, respectively, in prison for their violent and gruesome acts. At this stage, it was still pretty much anyone's game. Both defence and prosecution tried to prepare for the results. They didn't have to wait long. To their surprise, the jury took just three hours to come to their decision. State of Wisconsin versus George Stephen Birch, Brown County Case 16 CF 1309. The verdict reads as follows. We, the jury, find the defendant, George Stephen Birch, guilty of first degree intentional homicide, is charged in the information. It is signed by our four person and dated this first day of March 2018. The courtroom erupted as the jury convicted George Birch as guilty. The deciding factor in the end was this electrical cord. According to members of the jury, without this piece of evidence, George Birch likely would have walked free. George declined to say anything during his sentences, but the judge had some choice words for him. You know, I just, just a thought, Mr. Birch, he said, yes, sir, and no, so the manly thing would have been to say, I did it, I flipped out, I did whatever. Cop will plea, do something, and step up to the plate, and you chose not to do that. Drop the body off in a field, and then 12 hours later, go on a boat and be smiling like nothing happened. Like you didn't have a care in the world. How can we explain that? That isn't human. That is not normal. George Birch received life without parole. He will never see freedom again. Do you think the punishment fits the crime here? What do you think could be done to avoid something like this happening again in the future? Please do let me know down in the comments. And do remember to hit like if you appreciate what I'm doing here. Be careful out there and I'll see you soon.